All right, before we jump too much further into Calc BC, I just want to go over uh, some real basic derivative rules tonight. I'm hoping that this is the easiest video of the year. Um, but I, I will promise you this, the worksheet I have for you tomorrow will certainly have some challenges within it, and um, and we're going to try to really throw some new things at you with regards to these rules. But uh, So let's go ahead and jump in here. Let's see what we got cooking. Uh, the first one I want to go over is the power rule, the most basic. That's the first derivative rule you ever learn. And basically, it can be applied to all polynomials, and you just uh, you know tackle them one term at a time. So, of course, you know if we give you, uh, so we're going to say the rule is if we want to derive, you know, a term like x to the n. Notice the the variable is the base, and the uh, exponent is a constant. We're going to just say it's n times uh, x raised to the n minus one power, and that can be applied to each term one by one. Now, what I want you to think about is, you know, how could we rewrite some of these real nasty, um, you know, expressions? Don't be afraid. Before you take the derivative, don't be afraid, afraid to rewrite it and so that it's 5 thirds times x to the negative 1 half, all right? And then what you could do is, if this is your original f, I'm getting a little sloppy there, then f prime is going to be, let's see, negative one half times the five thirds is going to give me negative five six x. The new exponent is going to be negative three halves. Make sure you subtract one there. And then what, a lot of times, what you're going to do is you're going to rewrite it uh, so that we get rid of the negative exponent. I'm just going to say negative five divided by six times the square root of x cubed. All right, the product rule and quotient rule we're very very good at. Um, and uh, so if we uh, defined y as f times g, and we're going to run through that rule, we're going to say y prime is really the first function times the derivative of the second, and plus the second function times the derivative of the first, and that is certainly very commutative. And what I mean by commutative is that the order does not matter. We could do, because of the addition and the multiplication and stuff, we could say we could kind of flip-flop the order but still be equivalent. Now, where you want to watch out, though, is where you get into the quotient rule. And let's just say we said y was really f on top divided by g on the bottom. All right. Now order is going to be really important. We're going to say it's uh, the lower function times the derivative of the upper function minus the upper function times the derivative of the lower function all over the lower function squared. Okay, um, The one way I think of it is, it's, I always say it's low d high and minus high d low. So if you start your Start at the bottom of the mountain here and work your way up to the top where there's a minus sign and then you work your way back down the mountain and that's all over low squared. So I kind of have that visualization in my head and that helps me always remember the order. And what I want to stress is although we love these rules and we're pretty good at them, I want you to try to avoid. And if you take anything out of today's video, I want you to avoid these at all costs. And I want to go over a few examples. All right, so let's take, let's grab this one right here. Let's say... Let's take a look at y equals x to the 5 halves times the quantity 2x cubed minus 5x. Okay, So at first glance, a lot of people are going to jump on the product rule because they're going to say, you know, we've got the product between x to the 5 halves and this, this quantity here. And I want you to avoid that product rule like the plague. What I want you to do is don't use any calculus at first. Just distribute that x to the 5 halves. And the reason there's distributing allowed is because I don't have an exponent dangling up here in this area. Now, if I had an exponent like a 2 or a 3, then of course the distribution would be illegal. But since there's only like a technically a 1 there, I'm more than welcome to distribute. As you're distributing, let's add the exponents together. If I add the 5 halves to the 3, let's see, that's like 5 halves plus 6 halves. That's really going to be 11 halves. And minus 5x to the what? Let's see, that would be like 2 halves. So if I add them, I'm going to get 7 halves. Now we can derive and say, well, 11 halves times 2 is really 11x. Subtract 1. If I subtract, two, let's see, that would be 9 halves. Minus, let's see, 35 halves x to the 5 halves by the time I subtract 1. So there's an example where I avoided product. Now check this next one out. I'm going to avoid the quotient rule, and this is probably the most applicable one that I see a lot of. And um, why why am I trying to avoid the quotient rule? Two things. Number one, I'm going to save time, and number two, there's usually less room for careless mistakes 
when you avoid the quotient rule. So here's the problem I got cooking for you. 3x squared minus 6x plus 7 all over radical x. What we're going to do is, and, and this, I want you to pay attention, notice your denominator is a what? What's special about your denominator? It's a monomial, isn't it? And whenever we have a monomial, what we can do is I have this saying, we're going to make like a beaver and we're going to split it up. And I'm going to go in slow motion here. And I'm going to say I want 3x squared divided by radical x minus 6x divided by radical x plus 7 divided by radical x. Okay, you see the slow motion here? We're going real slow. We're dividing each individual term by radical x. We're splitting the one gigantic fraction into three individual ones. Again, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Now, as I'm dividing these here, I'm going to subtract the exponents. And I'm going to get x to the 3 halves minus 6x to the 1 half plus 7x to the negative 1 half. And I want to emphasize that up until this point, I have not done one lick of calculus. Just taking advantage of my algebra skills. At this moment, I'm ready to derive. I'm going to get 9 halves x to the 1 half minus 3x to the negative 1 half. And then we'll finish with negative 7 halves x to the what? Hopefully you said negative three halves. And of course we could clean that up and, and rewrite those, you know, so that it's um, you know all cleaned up with no negative exponents. And I trust that we are good at that. All right, now our favorite rule, perhaps uh, the chain rule. We we've been just a tad bit rusty on that these first couple of days, and certainly nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, I think uh, by the time we finish tomorrow's lesson, we're going to be real sharp. And I just want you to think about how you would pronounce this. You would say f of g of x. And anytime you feel yourself using the word of, and basically what we have is we have what's called a composition. That's what where that's where the chain rule comes from. It's whenever you have one function composed inside of another function, that's when you know you need to use chain rule. Anytime you feel yourself using the word of, you know you're going to be using chain rule. And so that derivative says y prime is simply we're going to derive the outer function maintaining the inner function the way it is for now and then finish by multiplying by the derivative of the inner function. So there's your chain rule. Let's go ahead, let's take a look at an example here. What if we said that y was equal to, let's see, let's go with 2x plus 5 divided by 4 minus x squared and that whole thing's being raised to the fifth power. So we've got quite a, quite a rascal here. And what you'll notice is we do have chain rule and within the chain rule is some quotient rule. Now a little bit of legwork here. I want you to identify who the outer function is and I want you to identify who the inner function is and practice some of our good terminology. I would say the outer function is a quantity to the fifth power and I would say the inner function is the quotient of 2x plus 5 all over 4 minus x squared. So as I go through my chain rule, I'm going to derive the outer function. I bring my 5 down. I leave the inner function alone for now. Notice I'm not touching it. I'm not doing quotient rule yet. My new exponent is a 4. At this moment, I have finished deriving the outer function. Okay, now it's time to multiply by the derivative of the inner function. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we're going to grab the quotient rule. And we're going to go low. We're going to wrap that up in parentheses. D high minus high d low, see if I can squeeze it in here. Whoops, almost forgot my negative on that x squared. Now, a lot of times what I do, if I, if I do have a negative in there, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make that a positive and make this a positive. Anytime I have those two negatives, I do that right away, all over the lower function quantity squared. Okay, now of course, uh, we could clean this bear up a little bit, but for the time of sake, and I trust that you uh, feel confident in doing so, we're going to move on. All right, uh, our exponential rule is one I'm not sure if we um, have, it, have, have had a chance to work with it a ton, but basically we're asking ourselves, how do we derive the famous function e to the x? Now the difference here, is, let me ask you this, how come the power rule does not apply? All right, how come the power rule does not apply? Well, the reason you're not allowed to use the power rule is because your base is e. And guess what? E is a constant. It's not a variable, is it? Okay, that's r rule number one. The second thing is look at your exponent. What do you notice about your exponent? It's a variable, isn't it? All right, those two reasons um, force us to say that the power rule is not applicable here. So what do we say? Well, the derivative of e to the x is simply itself, e to the x. Now, if we wanted to derive something with a more exciting exponent, such as, a, let's say, u, where, and we'll pull a little asterisk here, we'll say u represents any function of x that you could dream up, you know, 
anything that's a function of x, u represents. What we're going to say is it's e to the u power times the derivative of u, of course, with respect to x. And that's how we're going to derive all these functions. So we'll see a couple of those in the next example. So here's the really wild example I've got for you. I want you to say that y is equal to 4 times the sine of, um, let's say sine cubed, of e to the 5x power. Okay. Now, not only do we have chain rule here, but we have what I would call multiple layers to the chain rule. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify, in fact, let's rewrite it one time. Let's say 4 times the sine of e to the 5x and that whole thing's being cubed. All right. I think if we rewrite it, that's going to help. So let's say the outermost function is going to be 4 times some quantity to the third power. That's my outer function. Who's your middle function? My middle function is the sine of something. And my innermost is going to be e to the 5x. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so as you get ready for the chain rule, if you're struggling at all with chain rule, don't be afraid to take the time to identify who's outer, who's middle, and who's inner, and, and then we'll set forth from there. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to derive the outer function. While I do that, though, man, I don't know if i got enough room for this. We'll try to squeeze it in. So I'm going to do 3 times 4 is 12. While I do that, I'm not going to touch the middle or the innermost function. Make sure we don't touch those. Your new exponent is a 2 up there. Okay, times. Now derive the middle function. But do not touch the inner function. Last but not least, now we're ready to derive the innermost. That's going to be e to the 5x times the du, which in this case is a 5. So there's your e to the u times your du. Let me make a note of that just so you see where that's coming from. And then, of course, we could kind of clean it up. Uh, you know, 5 times 12 is 60. And, of course, we could say sine squared of e to the 5x times cosine of e to the 5x times e to the 5x. Something like that would be your final answer. You know, as we're getting ready to, we got like two slides left here tonight. Let me reemphasize, you know, one of the beautiful parts about the, the flipped classroom and, and the reason it's been such a success is that if I do get to go in too fast, let's say I went through the chain rule too fast or one of those earlier examples, you, you, we got to have enough self-discipline to, to hit that pause button and rewind it, rewatch it as many times as we need until we feel confident and understand the ins and outs of that problem. But anyway, what does W-E-T-L stand for? Okay, very simply put, it says we are going to write the equation of a what? Yeah, a tangent line. Okay, we're going to write the equation of a tangent line. And, and basically, anytime they want you to write a, a, an equation of a line, I want you guys to instantly start thinking of what we call the point-slope form of a linear equation. Okay, This is what I want you to use every single time. I've, and, I've, and I've mentioned this to several of you, if you as you've worked on your spirals. We don't have to clean these up. Once we get it in this form, bam, we're done. They're going to give us full credit at that moment right there. So what if I said to you that the function I wanted you to consider was the sine of x and I want you to write the equation of a line tangent to that curve at the moment when x equals pi over 3. Okay? I think the difference between good mathematicians and elite mathematicians is their ability to visualize the problem. All right? Here's what the sine curve looks from 0 to pi. And there's pi over 2 right there in the middle. So pi over 3 is going to be about right there. And what we're doing is we're trying to visualize this line right here that cuts through that curve. And basically, all i got to do is write the equation of that line. The first thing I want to find is I want to find the y value. What is the y coordinate at that moment? And simply evaluating f of pi over 3, and the sine of 60 degrees is indeed radical 3 over 2. Ladies and gentlemen, there is your y coordinate. So basically, the only thing I'm missing is my slope. To find the slope, I need to first find the derivative in terms of x, which in this case is the cosine of x. Now I can evaluate that derivative at the instantaneous moment, pi over 3. And the cosine of pi over 3, in this case, uh, is 1 half. So let's put all this information together. And I'm going to say y minus radical 3 over 2 equals 1 half times the quantity x minus pi over 3. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop right there. Okay, I'm not going to go any further than that. That's my final answer. Actually, I wanted to finish uh, with a kind of a mini lesson. And I, I've been asked this question several times over the last couple of days. How do I find a horizontal asymptote algebraically? Well, what we want to do is when you find, want to find a, a horizontal asymptote, what you want to do is you want to investigate what we call the end behavior of a graph. 
Okay. In other words, how is the graph behaving at its left and right-handed extremities? And in order to do that, if we want to analyze the right uh, end of a graph, the right extremity, we're going to ask ourselves, what's the limit as x approaches positive infinity? Okay. And then if we want to analyze the left edge of a graph in the in the b, well, I can't spell. Yikes. Um, we're going to just ask ourselves, what's the limit as x approaches negative infinity? And I would say 9 times out of 10, or even grade 99 times out of 100, these two answers are going to be the same, but they're certainly not guaranteed to be the same. They certainly could change. Now, so then that leads us to a whole other question. How do I evaluate these special limits algebraically? What we're going to do is we're going to do something that I call a power fight. What is a power fight? A power fight is when I compare the degree of the numerator to the degree of the denominator, and I simply ask myself, which, um, which one's bigger, the degree of the denu numerator or the degree of the denominator? And there's basically three possible outcomes when you have a power fight. Outcome number one is that you have small over large. Okay, that's my favorite one. For instance, if I had, you know, um, you know, 3x plus 1 all over 4 minus x squared, I have a first degree numerator, I've got a second degree denominator that's small over large, and there would be a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. Okay? In other words, we're saying that the limit as x approaches infinity is going to be a 0 in that particular problem every single time. Small over large, always 0. Number 2 is when we have large over small. So let's just flip that one around. Uh, let's say we had the function 4 minus x squared, and it was being divided by 3x plus 1. What's going to happen here is we say that uh, the, the limit does not exist. The limit doesn't exist. In other words, there are no horizontal asymptotes. Now, there is what we call an oblique asymptote in this particular example, uh, but that's usually the good news is with this, uh, the AP exam has kind of been trending away from oblique asymptotes, and it really hasn't been a, an area of concern. So all I want you to really know is that that limit does not exist, and there is no horizontal asymptote on that particular function. And then I save my the best for last here. Um, and the most popular case is if you have same over same, or what I would, sometimes I call it equal over equal. In that particular case, what we're going to do is we're going to divide the coefficients of the largest term on both in top and bottom. Okay, I'll just making a little note there. We're going to divide the coefficients of the largest terms. Let's see if we can get this in here. All right. So let's go back to that example. Uh, let's say we had, uh, let's just pretend that we had 3x squared plus 1 all over 4 minus x squared. So we just tweaked it slightly. If I evaluate that limit as x approaches infinity, I'm actually going to get negative 3 because I had the, the 3 on the top divided by the negative 1 on the bottom. That gave me negative 3. If they wanted the horizontal asymptote, make sure you always present that answer in the form of an equation and just say the asymptote is at y equals negative 3. So a little quick crash course on power fights and how to find horizontal asymptotes. Good luck. Catch you tomorrow.